Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast. I'm Dr. Rob Dixon, sitting in for Casey today, and today we've got Captain Andy Adams on the board for us. Good afternoon, Andy. And we have a special guest, Clayton Smith, one of our captains from the field, uh, who presented our case of the quarter. Good afternoon, Clayton. Afternoon, Doc. So this case of the quarter is a recurring series on the podcast in MCHD, and it stem from great clinical cases that our crews would bring us for quarterly CE. So we have a mandatory CE every quarter and we have all the crews in. And this is one of the cases that Clayton and his partner brought um, because it was not because of the outcome that it was this really neat save or something, but it was really this diagnosis, this diagnostic dilemma on a very small child that had a really scary event. And so today we're gonna talk about that case and we're going to start by talking about Bruy. So Bruy is brief resolved, unexplained event. And this is a term that's kind of a big catch-all term uh, for any event that is, the way I remember this is an event that scared the heck out of the parents. We get there, the kid's back to normal. So not a terribly common event. It's about 1% of all ED visits uh, and 1% of EMS runs. That being said, there's a lot of gnarly diagnoses that kind of lie underneath this catch-all term of brief resolved unexplained events. We're going to delve into that this afternoon on the podcast. This term replaced the old term, which was ALTI, which was a parent life-threatening event. Uh, In 2016, the change was made to go with Bruy. And really, when I read the pediatricians, when they write about it, Essentially, the brewery is just a little bit more specific and, and streamlined. Alti was any perception of anything like scary to the parent. And a lot of these kids uh, were getting overworked up and over hospitalized. So they narrowed the criteria with brewery in 2016 to try to decrease these unnecessary hospitalizations and potentially harmful uh, invasive tests on, on children. So, Clayton, let's start off. Tell us about the call you got. Uh, tell us about how it came out and what you guys' thoughts were when you were en route to this call. Yeah, so we were dispatched for an eight-month-old that was unresponsive and gray in color. Uh, we didn't have really any other call notes other than that. We had uh, district chief and fire department on the way, um, who fire department was closer than us, and then district chief was a little bit further um, behind. Um, but with not having many other call notes, we started talking about differentials and what task we would be doing. Um, some of the differentials we came up with were, you know, possible infection or sepsis, um, some sort of seizure. Maybe the kid got into parents' medication and so have some sort of toxin overdose, uh, maybe some sort of trauma um, or a undiagnosed like cardiac abnormality. Um, those are just some of the things that we kind of talked about on the way, um, trying to figure out exactly what what could be going on. We also talked about who would be doing what um, skills or procedures on scene. So who would have airway if we needed to perform any airway management, who would do vascular access, who would give medications, who's gonna try to get information from the caregiver. And so we kind of did all that and talked about it. So we had a game plan by the time we got on scene. Right, so excellent start, right? Pre-planning, you're intentionally thinking about this call, assigning roles, right? We're setting up our pit crew of when we have a critically ill child, who's going to do what? Tell us about the reference you use. When you go and pre-plan, does that include doses? And uh, how, do you, how do you obtain all that information? Tell the listeners a little bit about how we utilize that here. So for pediatrics, we have the Hand Heavy app, um, which basically you pull it up and you add a new patient. You select the patient's age and it gives you an ideal body weight for that patient. And then based off of that, with our protocols that we have into the app, um, it has your medication dosage, the total amount, um, normal vital signs, abnormal vital signs, uh, different sizes of equipment if you're going to have to do different procedures and all that. So uh, it kind of helps you. Instead of having to really think, it kind of puts it just right there at the front of your brain to help you uh, on these high acuity calls right and this is about as stressful as it can possibly get i don't i don't think you could get a call note that would drop that would be more stressful than this you talk about 
why use an app? And I think you put it very well, right? You have a lot on your mind. You're assigning tasks. You're thinking through a differential. You're thinking about what the scene is going to be like. And what the Hand Heavy app does for us is it cognitively unloads the crew to be able to have that at a fingertip, decrease in medication errors, decrease in, in u- utilization of the improper equipment. Uh, and we are, just for uh, all clarity here, we are not investors in uh, this product. Uh, we endorse it because we use it here at MCHD and have found it to be very, very useful. So let's shift gears to... We're going to get back to Brewery, but when we were talking about the app and how your approach is for critically ill children or pediatrics, just in general, give us a couple of your tips that you use and you use for our trainees in the field, Clayton, on how to approach these sick pediatric patients. Yeah, so you definitely want to undress the kids. Um, That way you can get a good physical assessment of them. Um, When you undress them, not only will you be able to see if there's any type of trauma, any bruising or anything like that, but you're going to be able to see their work of breathing. Are they using accessory muscles? Do they have any like intercostal retractions, tracheal tugging? You can see their, you know, if there's any general cyanosis or, you know, what their circulation really looks like. Um, And so it really helps you go back to your pediatric triangle to assess their appearance, their work of breathing and their circulation. So the big thing is get them undressed so you can actually see. Yeah, I mean, I think that that cannot be said enough. I think anyone that's listened to this podcast has heard Dr. Patrick and I say that over and over and over, and today we'll say it over and over and over. You can't, you know, a little bitty kid that is in a car seat in a onesie, swallowed with a bunch of blankets and has grandma's quilt laying over the car seat, we really can't tell anything about that kid. We can't tell what the work of breathing is. We can't see retractions. We really, I would argue, it's really hard to get a proper respiratory rate without addressing those age children and actually looking at them. And we're certainly not gonna see things like hair tourniquets, non-accidental trauma, other forms of pathology, maybe a big cellulitis. So always, always, always patients that can't speak to us, communicate with us, make sure they're fully undressed. What are some other things that you utilize in the field that you uh, use and, and teach your trainees? Kind of axioms about caring for these kids, about uh, specifically in cardiac arrest. So specifically with cardiac arrest, the biggest thing is, you know, you stay in play with these kids. Um, you want to make sure that you do perform high quality CPR and compressions. Um, you want to be able to oxygenate and ventilate these kids, whether it's BVM ventilations or an advanced airway. You got to get vascular access and you can give first round medications. You got to get pads on, you know, if you need to defibrillate and all that. And after you get those first round of drugs, it's the same thing that they can do in the hospital. We can just do it in the back of the ambulance, but we do it at a lot higher quality whenever we're staying in plane instead of driving down the road, trying to balance. Couldn't agree more. And I would, I think the analogy that we use in EMS and, and some of you that have done this before is the football, right? So the parent, insert law enforcement officer, or firefighter comes running out the front door when the ambulance arrives with the football, throws the football to the EMS provider who puts the football in the back of the truck uh, where some sort of CPR is done and some interventions are attempted while you're racing at breakneck speed down to the hospital. Uh, there's lots of great evidence out there that that's not a good thing for children. So regardless of what your protocol says, whether it is that you uh, resuscitate all on scene, I would encourage all the providers out there to give it the first couple of minutes. Give me a five, five good minutes there and those things, focus on those things in the first five minutes of the resuscitation that Clayton talked about. So good high quality CPR someone get on the airway and op airway start ventilating the patient plus minus an advanced airway if that's in your protocol someone get vascular access you usually buy an io give a fluid challenge to these kids right give them a fluid challenge and the first dose of weight-based epinephrine so early good high quality cpr airway management vascular access with fluid bolus and first dose of epinephrine at the very minimal on scene before you make a decision to transport that patient. So well said. 
So we talked about the pediatric assessment trial triangle and kind of our general approach to these kids. Let's get back to our case and talk about BRUI. So brief, resolved, unexplained event. Give us the diagnostic criteria that we use for this. So um, as you said earlier, it's specific to patient populations of less than one year old. Um, it, the event lasts less than one minute. So by the time we get on scene, the child should be appearing normal um, in order to classify as a brewery. Um, they have to have some sort of, whether it's some sort of change in color, work or breathing, altered level of consciousness, they have to have at least one of those along with the other one, other couple um, diagnostic tools to right. be able to. So I like it, they use the same thing, one. So it's easy for me to remember even, right? Age less than one, last less than one minute was some scary thing to the parents. So change in tone, uh, change in respiratory effort or some change in their level of consciousness in the patient. So there are low risk criteria. So breweries, they, for the emergency physician side of it, we put them in low risk and high risk. And I'm not going to go deep down into those because I want to be really, really clear to our listeners. This is not a low risk diagnosis for our patient population here in EMS. All of these patients and families should be encouraged EMS transport and a proper medical evaluation for all these children in the hospital, right? That being said, I have to talk a little bit. They kind of would make sense to you what we would call low risk in the emergency department. So now I've gotten the patient from you. So the low risk criteria are, they make sense to us. It's the, the kid's older. The older the kid is, the less risky. So kids greater than 60 days, it's less risky. We know that you're more susceptible to all kinds of things in the first couple of months of life. So prematurity, younger, less developed, more risky. And the one I just have to talk about because I just couldn't believe my eyes that it's under the low risk criteria is did not get CPR by a medically trained provider. So that blew me away. I'm going to go out on a limb here in the podcast and say as an emergency physician, I don't think many emergency physicians in the hospital be very comfortable calling a brewery low risk when the mom did CPR or someone else did CPR, right? That is a kid that's getting worked up and getting observed in the hospital. I'll just go out on a limb there and say that. Uh, it's That one kind of blew me away. So let's go into how often do we see these things? And, and, like, and we'll, then we'll talk about the outcome of your particular case. So it's about 1% of calls that we run, um, at least here related to MCHD. Um, pulling up call um, notes and stuff from the past year. Okay. So 1% of calls and about 1% of ED visits. It makes sense. A lot of these get an EMS transport to the hospital and evaluation. When they're in the hospital, what happens in the next bit of time is we only make a, a definitive diagnosis in about 50%, about half of these cases. The more important number here is about 4% of these, or about 1 in 25 of these children, is going to have one of those serious underlying diagnoses that was in Clayton's differential. So seizures or toxins, non-accidental trauma, sepsis, endocrine, hypoglycemia, or some cardiac abnormality that was not diagnosed at birth. So some fairly gnarly diagnoses there. So Clayton, finish this up a little bit as we get towards the end. Tell us a little bit about this, like what happened in your case. So when we arrived on scene, fire department was already there. And, and you were ready. You were we, we were, planned, man. <laughs> we were ready to Everybody go. Everybody was ready to go. And uh, we see grandma walking out, holding the kid, and the kid is looking around and looks great just from what we can see across the yard. So grandma brings the kid out, put the kid on the stretcher, and the kid's acting like an eight-month-old should, crying, pulling away from us, not really wanting to get on the monitor and all that kids acting great it was a sigh of relief for us for sure um ultimately we we uh biggest challenge was kind of consoling grandma and helping ease her worries and all that and then we had a um easy transport to the hospital let the kid watch some netflix or whatever little show that baby kept, sharks exactly right? they, they love baby like sharks that. yeah so. and that was it so that was a to you listeners out there and the folks watching on the YouTube channel, that was a real deflating one. Like, 
we, we should have made up a better ending, like it was this great save or some other pathology. But I really wanted to kind of give what a general one looks like. Most of the time, the kid's going to be fine when we get there. They have normal vitals. They have a normal examination. Make sure you understand that this is still a very, very high-risk case, right? And that's what throws providers off is these kids look great. But still, 1 in 25 of them is going to have something really, really bad, some serious pathology underlying that event that they had before you got there, something that scared the parents so bad that they called 911. And when we looked at our own internal data, it scared all of our clinical staff, it scared both medical directors to death uh, because we had refusals on it in 2021 on about almost 30 of these kids. And I wrote on my notes here to talk about this the youngest being nine hours old to one month old in that group of 27 that their parents did not want us to transport that kid, right? All of them were less than a month old. One of them was nine hours old. So this is an extraordinarily high risk patient population. Uh, and one of the things that I use when I talk, speak to parents about this is I tell them, you know, yes, we agree. Your kid looks really, really great now. We're really happy about that. Something must have really frightened you to call us here. There are some serious underlying things that could be wrong, and we really need to take your child in to the hospital and have the physician examine your child. The child may need more testing, and there's certain tests we, can't, we don't have here in the field. We can't make these diagnoses. But there's some pretty bad underlying things like seizures and bad infections and things that we think we'd really like to encourage you to allow us to transport your child to the hospital, right? Advocate for the patient. Because uh, I, was, I was blown away. We, in our serious event, just from years of reviewing charts and cases here, we, we've had some serious events in these kids, right? We've had kids that had subdural hematomas chief complaint, some alteration in mental status, normal examination, normal when they got there, uh, sepsis cases, and on and on and on, right? All those other pathologies and the differential that we listed, those cases are out there. They exist within those, you know, couple of hundred cases in our service that were less than one year old that we took refusals on last year. If you go by this data, 4% of them are gonna have some serious underlying condition. So a fairly big number when you apply it to that big of an end, and you can apply it to your service. So let's take it home. Brewies, right? Brief resolve, unexplained event, replace the old ALTI. It's just a little bit more uh, specific uh, to dial it in to a certain group of high-risk patients. Remember, the child has to be less than one year of age. The event lasts less than a minute, and you have to have a change in something that scared the parent. So a change in tone, some change in mental status, or abnormal breathing or color change, something of that sort. About 4% are going to have one of these serious diagnoses. And we'll say it again. What are those diagnoses, Clayton, that you're worried about when you see these kids? You know, seizures, toxin overdose, um, infection, sepsis undiagnosed cardiac abnormality, you know, trauma, something along those lines. Right. So I think that really covers it pretty well. Uh, we hope this has been helpful for providers out there. As always, if you have questions, you can email us at the podcast email, podcast at mchd-tx.org. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And watching out there, if you watch us on YouTube, Dr. Patrick, I would be very remiss if I didn't ask for a like five-star Google rating, uh, something of that sort. Please leave us, please leave us your questions, comments. We love listener feedback uh, here on the podcast, and we're going to start a little new section likely soon where we go over some of those comments and letters from our viewers and listeners. So, Clayton, thanks a lot for coming in, sharing the case, and being part of the Case of the Quarter yeah, series. Appreciate it. Yeah. Andy, thank you for sitting in, doing all the legwork today for us. All right. That's all for us here. We'll see you next time.